Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it's true. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We hear a voice call our name, and we know that our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Greetings, friends, and welcome to a very special service of worship here at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church as we celebrate the resurrection. All during the season of Lent, we've been considering what it means to be a covenant people. And today, we remember that even when our faith falters, even when we fall away, our God remains steadfast. God is always true to the covenant. And so we experience new life, even when we don't deserve it. And what will we do? Will we be like the women in Mark's gospel, whose story we hear today, so startled, so shocked, so confused by the things that they see and hear, that they run from fear and say nothing to anyone because they are afraid? Mark's gospel seems to be unfinished. In fact, there are verses that have been added probably by someone else at a later date. Nevertheless, we're going to consider today what Mark might have intended by that original, abrupt, unfinished Easter kind of ending. I hope that you'll stay in worship with us to the very end and to the time of new beginning. As you do, all the words that you need to participate fully will appear on the screen, but in the comments and description attached to this video, you'll find an order of service and announcements of upcoming events in the life of the church. While you're there, take a moment to register your attendance and share a prayer concern with us if you would like. Finally, there's a place where you can make a donation either by texting online or through the mail to further the work that God is doing here in Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. As we're preparing for worship, will you join with me in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection may, by the renewing of your spirit, arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us rejoice as we go to the piano. And Loella reminds us of the events of this holy week culminating in the resurrection as she plays How Beautiful. Thank you. 
Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Easter. I'm dressed in some of my uh, work clothes today because I, what I'm doing might be a little messy. I even have some gloves on my hands. Um, today we're going to talk about sin. You might have heard that word sin, but maybe you're not sure what it means. Sin is anything that we do or say or even think that goes against what God has taught us in the Bible. The Bible teaches us how to live the way God wants us to, the best way to live. And so when we sin, when we go against that way of living, it makes God unhappy. So first, we're going to kind of think about, we're going to make a list. We're going to make a list of all the things we can think of that might be sin, things that make God happy, something that we say or do or think that might make God happy. I'm going to make a list, so you be thinking, and I'll start thinking too. I'm writing on an egg today because I didn't have any paper, and it's Easter, so I thought that might be a good thing to write on. All right, something that would make God unhappy. I know something when we tell a lie. Do you think that would make God unhappy? I do. I'm going to write that right on here. Lie. When we lie. What about when we don't obey our parents? Though definitely we should obey our parents, shouldn't we? Have you thought of something? Um, what if we don't take turns? Boy, our egg is getting really full. It's not all clean and white like it was. I think we could go on and on till it was solid black. It's just dark and messy right now, isn't it? <clears throat> you know, that's what sin does to our hearts. If we sin and do things that make God sad, it changes our heart. It changes it. It makes it dark and messy like this. But you know what? Easter is a day of good news. It's good news because Jesus is God's son. He came to earth as a baby. He was born in a manger. Remember all the story at Christmas? And as he grew, as he was a little boy, he learned about God at the temple, and he actually taught people at the temple. Jesus knew so much because he was God's son. And he wanted to tell others how to live the way God wanted them to live. And Jesus never sinned. Jesus never did anything wrong. Well, the problem was, even though Jesus was so good and helped so many people, there were people that didn't like him actually hated him and they wanted to kill him and they did. Jesus died on a cross. But three days later, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead and he was alive. He was alive. After three days, he came back. And you know, if we believe that Jesus died for us, and he saved us from our sins when he did. Then we believe that he will forgive us when we sin. Remember how we talked about our hearts get all dirty and messy and blackish and darkish when we sin? But when Jesus forgives us for our sins then our hearts are just as clean and white as this egg. All that old messy, dirty peeling came off, and inside this egg is clean and white and soft again. And Easter today is our reminder that Jesus came to earth, he died on the cross, he came back to life to wash our sins away 
to wash them all away and make us as clean and white and soft as snow. He peels away our sin and he makes our hearts clean again. Let's say our prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for forgiving us for our sins if we ask you and if we are truly sorry. In your name we pray. Amen. Listen for the word of God. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, beginning at the first verse. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture.
prayer? Let us pray. O oh God, as you have made yourself available to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, so receive us as we make ourselves available to you in his name. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Give us your word, Lord Jesus, and let the people of God say, Amen. Reading Mark's account of the resurrection always reminds me of being in Ms. Hilliard's third grade class at Highland Park Elementary School in Jackson, Tennessee. I learned a love of literature from her. She would read stories to us and with almost without exception, she would read to the last chapter or to the last page and then she would simply stop. And our assignment for the rest of the day would be to write our own ending of the story. Mark's gospel has that same sort of feeling. It's really a most peculiar way to end a gospel. Three women go to the tomb on Easter morning. It's their intent to anoint the body, but they find that the body is gone and the tomb is empty. They encounter at the tomb a man in a white robe who tells them that Jesus is risen. He goes on to say that they should go and tell his disciples that Jesus will go before them to Galilee. The women then flee from the tomb, overwhelmed by fear and astonishment. How different Mark's story is from that of the other gospel writers, Matthew and Luke and John. They all have wonderful Easter morning stories. They tell of Jesus revealing himself to the women who came to the tomb. They tell of appearances to the other disciples. They tell of the sadness that is turned to joy. In other gospels, Easter morning is glorious, but not so for Mark. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. No shout of victory, no squeals of joy, no hallelujah chorus with full orchestra and hundred voice choir. There's only astonished silence. Of course, the way the gospel ends leaves most people uncomfortable. And so through the years, they've tried to explain how it came to be the way that it is. Some have proposed that Mark originally wrote an ending, but through, that through the years, wear and tear on the manuscript meant that part of it became frail, the part that was most popular, and that was the story of the resurrection, and it eventually just got lost. Others have suggested that there may have been some people opposed to the gospel who came and literally tore it off, and others have even suggested that Mark penned his gospel from prison and that just when he was about to write the story of the resurrection, his captors came and carried him away to his death. If you have a modern Bible, you can see that subsequent editors have actually added additional verses to round out the story. And all of these kinds of explanations have been given, but they've all failed to convince. The evidence is overwhelmingly behind the fact that Mark meant for his gospel to end this way with no resurrection appearance and the women running, frightened from the tomb, unwilling or unable to speak because of their great fear. Which begs the question, if Mark intended his gospel to end this way, in what essentially is a non-ending, why? Why would he leave it unfinished? And of course, we can't read Mark's mind, but we may have some clues right here in his gospel to suggest what may have been his motive. As we read the gospel, especially as we get over to the last chapters, we notice that Mark has created a pattern of promise and fulfillment. He records a number of promises Jesus makes, but he always is careful to show how those promises find fulfillment. Writing in this way, Mark creates a kind of suspense for his reader. He records a promise. He lets one shoe fall, uh, to use an old expression, and then he later uh, reveals the fulfillment and the other shoe drops. For example, when Jesus is preparing for the Passover, he tells his disciples to go to the city and they will find a man with a water jug who will lead them to a house in which there will be a room where they can celebrate the Passover. One shoe falls. And then a little while later, the men go into town and everything happens just the way that Jesus predicted. And the other shoe falls. 
At the Last Supper, Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And around the table, they look at one another. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? For a few hours, they do not know who it will be. But then, when they're gathered for prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes and betrays Jesus with a kiss, and the other shoe falls. Later, addressing the whole group of disciples, Jesus says, you will all fall away, and they swear that they will not. And we listen intently for the other shoe to fall. And sure enough, on crucifixion day, at the foot of the cross, not one of them is to be seen. The other shoe falls. The prediction has come true. And who can forget the personal promise that Jesus made to Simon Peter? Truly, I tell you, he says, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. One shoe. A short time later, in the courtyard next to a charcoal fire, Peter says once, twice, three times, I don't even know the man. And the other shoe falls. And then there's one more promise that Jesus made. After I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus promises that following the resurrection, he will meet his disciples in Galilee. But as Mark tells it, that promise was never fulfilled. Mark is careful to document the fulfillment of all the other promises. He wants us to see that the things that Jesus promises actually find fruition, that Jesus is trustworthy and true. But what about this last promise? The messenger at the tomb even reiterates the promise to the women. He will go before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. But the gospel ends and we're still waiting. We're still wondering. When will the other shoe fall? Mark has set up his story in such a way that we know that it will be fulfilled, but the question is where and how? In just a few minutes, our time of worship together will have come to an end. If you're like most people, you're probably going to gather with friends for a meal or with family. Perhaps this afternoon you'll have an egg hunt or maybe even take a well-deserved nap. For all intents and purposes, Easter will be over for most of us. But when all of this is said and done, when we walk out and uh, carry on with our regular lives, what will the resurrection mean for us tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that? If this year is like most, we'll hear one shoe fall on Easter Sunday as we cry, He is risen! He is risen indeed! And we believe that but we go away wondering what it means. Where is the risen Christ? Where does the Easter proclamation really impact our lives? How does it touch us here and now? It shouldn't surprise us if whatever we hope to experience doesn't happen immediately. Mark warned us that it might not. He says, he is not here. But don't we all know that? Don't we sense it? And therefore we wonder, if he's not here, then where is he? The role of the messenger in the story is to remind us he goes before you to Galilee, just as he told you he would. But where is Galilee? Of course, for the disciples, it was home. It was where they became followers of Jesus Christ, where they were commissioned to fish for people. Galilee is the world. It's their everyday life, the place where they live and move and have their being. The messenger reminds them, he's not here. He's gone before you to Galilee. There you will meet him. That's Mark's message to us. And his strange ending strikes a resonant chord within each of us. We believe that Christ is risen, but we have yet to discover the, full, the fullness of what it means. For that fullness, Mark says, we'll have to look out there in the world in the real world, in our daily experience. That's the part of the story that Mark leaves untold. He leaves us waiting for the other shoe to fall. But he suggests, he suggests to us how and where it might. On Friday, according to Mark, when all of Jesus' disciples had flown the coop, there were some soldiers standing around the foot of the cross. And among them, among them was a centurion a Roman officer who was over a hundred troops. And Mark says that the centurion looked up and saw the face of the dying man and said, 
truly this man was the Son of God. It's peculiar, isn't it? That Mark's gospel, the disciples and the women who were closest to Jesus, they never understood who he was. They didn't even remember that Jesus had promised that he would meet them in Galilee. And so they didn't go to Galilee and seek him among the living. Instead, they went to the tomb expecting him to be dead. And when he wasn't there, they were filled with fear. And yet, an outsider, a Galilean, standing in the shadow of the cross, a witness to history's greatest injustice, came to the faith. The affirmation of faith in Mark's gospel is not on the lips of the disciples or the women. None of the religious leaders profess faith. Instead, the profession of faith is on the lips of one of his executioners. And do you remember who it was that buried Jesus? Not the disciples, not the women. It was Joseph of Arimathea, remember him? A member of the council that condemned Jesus to death. He will go before you to Galilee. There you will see him, the messenger proclaims. And that is to say that it will be in the workaday world, even in the midst of darkness and disbelief, in the heart of human suffering, in the moment of tragedy, that's where he will appear. That's when the other shoe will fall and Jesus' promise to be with us will be fulfilled. Not so much in the hallelujahs and the lilies and the shouts of victory, as important and as significant as they are, but in the real world where life is sometimes difficult and often painful and sometimes relentingly harsh, where God seems to be far away and the flames of hope have been extinguished. In Galilee, at the place where we least expect him, when tragedies strike and when we are hurt and we feel lost and alone as if we are God forsaken. No wonder the message that he'll meet us in Galilee is frightening to us. But that is what Easter is all about. An inspiring, soaring worship experience is only a part of the good news of Easter. Easter is the reaffirmation that he is risen, yes, but it's also the promise that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We can return to our world. We can be about the business that God has given us to do. And just the time that we need him most, Jesus has promised always to be with us. If you are looking for Jesus, my hope is that you will not go to the tomb, but that instead you will go to the world and that with a word of hope and proclamation on your lips, rather than being filled with fear, you will share good news. He is risen, just as he said, and he is joining us in our world, in his world, in this world and in the next. Amen and amen. May God bless you and keep you this Easter and in all of your tomorrows until we meet again. Amen.